with smaller vendors, and we've seen a lot of smaller companies generate devices like this, like like Meet Circle. Um, they, th there's just no, no good way for them to do updates. And the, the, the code's buggy. You've got a lot of exposed endpoints that probably don't need to be there. And it, it, I mean, granted, there's a lot of new people doing it. And that's cool. That's great. You know, innovation in the market. But at the same time, there's, you know, obviously a lot of security issues. So yeah, let's a quick, a quick case in point as to why this is an issue. Um, if you guys remember Brickerbot, that's the more common name, but it was also called Internet Chemotherapy. Um, some guy named Janitor, uh, pretty, pretty cool. Um, he ended up bricking like a couple million, uh, couple million devices by his count, and just to like prevent them from being part of botnets, because this is what this is what you're doing. You got exposed cameras, easy peasy exploitation. They're being used for botnets and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's it's kind of an issue, um, I would say. But yeah, l let's keep going uh, on to the the meaty subject of the matter. So, <laughs> this is the product that we looked at. It was actually really cool because we were at a, a team offsite in uh, Montreal, and uh, we were going to have just a, a mini project, you know, just hey, let's buy a bunch of devices from Best Buy or some shit, and just figure out which one to to, ha to have some fun with. And so Eve, my manager, comes home like like Christmas with a bag of shitty IoT devices. It was it was the best thing ever, and uh, like I just pointed at the Disney one, and I'm like, I want that one. So. Um, I, I've had a lot of fun on this project. Um, a quick overview of what the project or what the product actually does. It's it's basically to protect your kids, right? So that's that's why it's Disney branded, I suppose. Um, but yeah, so essentially, you dump it on your network. It starts art poisoning immediately, which I found to be kind of funny. Yeah, every every FN device on your network is suddenly going routed through this circle. Uh, and then after after you do that, it it starts to actually uh, log all the DNS lookups. It starts to art poison. Or sorry, I already mentioned that. But it'll actually uh, it's got a set list of like depending on the age you set for your kids and so forth. And you can do it per device, right? Depending on the on the list, there's a set blacklist and whitelist of sites they're allowed to go to. So. Uh, that, that's the main purpose. And if it doesn't actually have the site listed, it'll actually go and quarry the cloud with blue coat and try to figure out, oh, hey, should we allow this DNS domain name? And the funniest thing, like, I thought as a kid's device, like, a kid's device shouldn't be blocking VPN traffic. But, um, yeah, anywho, so it, it's it's got its quirks. Um, these are all the bugs we found in it. <laughs> um, as I was mentioning before, like, uh, yeah, th I mean, so it's a lesser-known company, and Disney happened to license the product, which was, I don't know, good from a, I don't know, a view standpoint. But yeah, it, it had a few issues, to say the least. And here's the obligatory pie chart to categorize the bugs. Uh, there was a shit ton of command injection. I mean, we we found that in like every IoT device. Um, I know Claudio. He before we were working on the circle, he did a, he did a project on the FOSS cam. Which is just some crappy uh, security camera, and like you thought that list was bad. It was it was 30 instead of 23, um, and he said it was like 20 command ejections, and it's just I don't know. I'm kind of disappointed by that, to be fair. Um, yeah. So today's talk's not going to be all about all the bugs, because honestly, like I said, a lot of them are command injection, and not that interesting. So um, I basically pulled out a set of the more interesting and novel bugs that I I personally enjoy. Um, so yeah, I, I hopefully we'll have a good time. Um, so the first one, um, I mean, I'm sure most of us, I'm not sure about the, the level of you all, but I'm sure hopefully most of us have heard of use after free vulnerabilities, right? Easy peasy, you know, it's one of the classical, more old school volumes, I would say. But I'm, this isn't as different, but it's something to be aware of. Uh, use after realloc. Um, yeah, it's just not as well known as its, I guess, older cousin. Um, if you people are reallocating things in a loop or a lot, it, there's a chance that stuff might not go as they expect. Because, yeah, realloc, not many. I don't know. It's it's one of the lesser known memory allocation functions, and it has a, li a lot of quirks if you're not aware of them. So, um, a quick refresher about uh, memory layouts in Linux, I suppose. Um, so, if we imagine that those colorful blocks are Linux memory space, um, stack grow, stack and heap grow towards each other. Shared libs are in the middle. Um, this is on 64 bit at least, um, and and there's a, there's a bunch of other things. Not really that important, but. Um, 
Uh, half of its kernel memory, so forth. Uh, the important one that we're going to be talking about is the heap, obviously, since it's, we're talking about memory management. Um, dynamically allocated stuff goes on the heap. So zooming in on the heap, um, we've got, so the, the heap is just a block. It goes in one direction. Uh, there's spots that are not yet allocated but are still heap. And there's also spots that haven't been allocated but that can be turned into heap. Um, and there's also a spot in the in the not allocated but not yet heap part where big chunks of memory go, and that's going to be important later. Um, it's actually after where all the normal heap allocations go and so forth. But yeah, uh, big allocations at least for UC libc malloc, which is what was in the Disney Circle. It's a version of malloc that's for embedded devices. Um, it, this is for greater than one memory or one megabyte. Uh, that's what gets mapped into the bigger areas. So. Some more overview. Um, what does a free chunk look like? Free chunks are not the same as allocated chunks. It's just a piece of memory, but um, free chunks have a lot more pointers and metadata to them. Uh, it's not that important, especially for these bugs, so I'm not going to really go over it that much, but um, typically speaking, you've got four uh, different memory allocation basically used or functions for this. malloc, calloc, which are like the same thing, basically. Um, free and realloc. And realloc, as I said before, realloc is essentially the one I'm going to be talking about today because not many people use it. For good reason, too. Um, <laughs> yeah, anyways. Uh, realloc's got its quirks. Like, you can actually pass null uh, parameters to realloc. Um, and it'll do funny things. If you point it, or if you give it a null size but a valid pointer of to valid memory, it acts as free. If you give it a, if you give it a null pointer but you give it a size, it acts as malloc. And if you give it null as both, it ends up doing like malloc eight. Um, so there's a bunch of neat little things that it does. Um, but yeah, so what exactly am I talking about uh, with a uh, use after realloc? Well, you would think, you know. What realloc does, you pass it a pointer, you get a bigger pointer. That's the, that's the key of realloc, right? Um, but interesting things happen. Uh, there's no guarantee that the pointer you pass in to be resized actually points to the same memory that you get back. So that, that's kind of key. It returns a pointer and you pass it a pointer. Those pointers are not necessarily pointing to the same part of memory. So there's certain situations where this occurs. Um, oh, I already covered that. Well, um, yeah, and I already covered that too. Cool. So uh, as I said, this is important. There's no guarantee you get the pointer, same pointer back. OK? Cool. So um, situation one in which you don't get the same pointer back. So if you have a small allocation, say like, uh, I don't know, something that belongs in the heap, something less than one megabyte, and then suddenly it gets Reallock to a really large size, it gets shifted into a different memory space. I mean, it's still a part of the heap, but it's not in the same part of the heap. It's in a different spot, and that's that's important as we'll go over soon. Um, there's also another situation. So that's situation number one. Uh, situation number two is if there's another chunk sitting in front of it, and you reallock it so it gets a little bit bigger, but it would overrun into another chunk, it's going to shift onto the other side. I mean, easy peasy. Um, there's not that much to these uh, use after reallocs. But yeah, so there's two conditions. And what does this mean? Dangling pointers. If you happen to assign a pointer to the space and memory and then realloc it, there's a chance that you'll end up with a dangling pointer, which is bad, typically. Uh, and it ends up being a classical use after free situation. So um, Disney with Circle had an unfortunate uh, piece of code. They actually reused a really solid piece of code called mini HTTPD. Um, that's really old school, probably older than I am. And um, but they did it. They they added a little stuff to it and of their own little little magic sauce. And what ended up happening is we could just send unauthenticated, unauthenticated HTTP requests and start dumping strings out of a database with it. So that was not optimal on their part. So um, yeah. So that that was issue number one. I thought it was interesting. It's not really as well known as the the class clues after free. But so <laughs> this is this one's funny. Um, so SSL attribute parsing. I mean. There's, there's well-known ways to do SSL stuff, right? You have a cert, and your cert has some attributes in it. We want to make sure that the signed certificate is for the host name that we're intending, right? So it, it's, it's not too bad. Um, there's various ways to implement this. Um, and because of how Circle did it, we are actually able to just like completely ignore SSL for basically all their, cli or all their clients on the box. 
Um, so yeah, and also another reason why I mention this, because their domain name is called Meet Circle, and <laughs> let that sink in for a second. We had some very creative exploit names. <laughs> so yeah. <sighs> the, the, the theme of this presentation could have gone a completely different direction. <laughs> so yeah, what? A website for it? Yeah, there, of course there's a website. Um, I think it's uh, meetcircle.com or some shit. <laughs> we, we had a lot of fun, right? I've already had my giggles. I, d I just, you know. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, how they ended up actually doing their SSL parsing. They, they used a rather deprecated function called X, um, X509 name one line. And essentially, it just takes all the attributes of your SSL cert and puts it onto one line. That's a C string. Um, so null terminated at C string. Easy. Um, something that's not really, it, this wasn't an issue, but something to note if you ever happen to use this or see it for some reason, it can actually, if there's no buffer passed in as the second parameter, it allocates memory from the heap, but if they pass something on from the stack and the second, uh, it doesn't return any new memory. So, yeah, that's, if you have control of buff, that might be an issue. But anyways, so. Next slide. So yeah, um, as, as hopefully you can see down at the bottom, like that's an example of what a given certificate would give for its attributes. Um, for, you know, boopdoop.net. Um, yep, so as we keep going. Uh, and this is the, the MIPS that they actually use to validate it. If you see uh, um, <laughs> the meetcircle.com down there, um, I'm just gonna get it laughs every time I say meat circle, this is great. Um, so yeah, uh, that's the that's the return value of our one line buffer function, the x509 call that we had earlier. So remember, it's just a string with all of our cert attributes. It's nothing special, um, and yeah, and then we try to compare it to meet circle down here. So <laughs> um, yeah, so that's all it is. It seriously does a stir stir, which if you're not familiar with stir stir, it takes one string and then tries to find the first. Um, the first occurrence of the, the needle in the haystack, okay? It takes two, two, two C strings as its parameters. So yeah, it was, it was pretty simple code. So what's the issue here? Um, so yeah, uh, obviously, and th th this, this would not match. If I tried to present my boopdoot.net cert, it's not gonna match strictly because, you know, those, are, those two strings are not equal. And, but the funny thing is about certificates is like the only limiting factor, you can generate whatever cert you want, right? But it just depends on what shady CA you can get to sign it. So um, yeah, one hilarious attack. And this one actually, I will say, didn't work, which made me kind of sad because I thought it was really cool. Um, I found a source for it. Uh, if you're more interested in the original bug, there was a bug in MongoDB that actually had the same exact issue. Um, but regardless, um, so yeah, the, the issue is what if I have an organization that is equal to cn equals star.meetcircle.com? There's no limitation on my organizational attribute. It's just another string. So if I manage to do that, I could actually get it to stir stir and match it. Easy peasy. I just have a forge cert that I can get it to, I, I can man in the middle of the SSL traffic now. The issue for this one though is that they had two cert pins um, in the circle, one for Entrust, one for Komodo. And I tried getting both to sign something like that, and apparently CAs do something smart, like get rid of everything you put except for the domain name, and then like put a sign by Komodo or so forth. So um, yeah, that, that kind of made me sad. Uh, we spent a little bit of money for that, so it, it, was, it was sad face day. So yeah, um, we've established that that's not gonna work, okay? Um, oh, boop, because that's not gonna match, okay? And no CA is gonna sign, oh, my slide's going wrong. Yeah, no CA is gonna sign that, right? But, <laughs> and this just made me really happy. What, do you think we can get a CA to sign that? <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of no, new domains, or top level domains out there, TLDs, if you, if you have not heard the news. Um, dot company, dot computer, dot community. <laughs> I thought that was a really simple bug, but it was really funny because I'm not sure if developers really realize this yet. Um, we can get, we, we could get any one of those signed, and we did. And suddenly we've got an easy way to man in the middle all their SSL traffic. And you have to understand, this isn't just, 
metadata of what children are looking up, because it was that, <laughs> but it was also um, tokens that would allow us to gain root access to the circle. So if we can manage to get like a, I don't know, a, a DNS intercept and just intercept the meet circle domain, um, suddenly we can just root your box like from outside of your network, and that's sweet. So. Yeah, and the, the cool thing is, if you ever want to try something like this, there is typically a, a different TLD extension for each like lower level one. So .com, .community, .net, .network, .org, .organic for some reason. But yeah, so that was a funny bug. And like I was saying, there, it's not that complicated, but the, the data through which was passing this traffic was a, a tad bit useful, so. All right, so my next set of bugs, Wi-Fi, SSID vulnerabilities, and like I said before, th uh, this set isn't the most complicated either. Probably the most complicated was going to be the use, be use between Reox, but um, the vectors through which we did this stuff was completely over Wi-Fi. Like we could have just driven by and done some of these. And yeah, anyways, I, I, I we're driving IoT devices sounds pretty cool to me. I'm bringing it back. So. Um, yeah, the, the reason why this is an issue, or why this problem exists in the first place, I'm sure you've seen IoT devices that are just like, press this button, you're configured, easy, yeah, go you, you're the best. And they're not really geared towards your average techie or hacker, so there's not much in-depth knowledge that you really need to know about in order to get these things up. Um, in the case of the Disney Circle, the, that was especially bad, because... Um, <sighs> The, the, so this was especially bad because instead of checking all of your Wi-Fi attributes, it just made sure, oh, is the Wi-Fi the same? You know, it'll connect to the same Wi-Fi and the same password that it has configured, okay? But it doesn't really care about anything else. In fact, I, it, it'll try to authenticate with no password, too. Um, so if we happened to de-auth a circle off its network, broadcast an SSID that was the exact same, but a little bit stronger signal, suddenly we get a circle connecting onto our network with all the fun endpoints exposed at that point. So that, that was an issue unto itself, and we had a lot of bug chains that could actually end up being used with that. Um, because, I mean, you get a free circle on your network, that's, that's just great, because the hard part is actually talking to it. Um, and yeah, so like, like I'm saying, like some of these are not, not the most complex, but they, they lead to other fun things. So using host APD, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, host APD, you can, you can broadcast SSIDs with non-printable characters. And it's pretty cool. I think you can do Unicode and stuff too. I, I think there's even like emoji SSIDs, like all the kids do and stuff. Yeah. Kids nowadays. Um, but... So the, using, <laughs> using a couple of cool little tricks, we could actually get a, a reverse shell from the box. Um, this one required admin access, though, like having an admin token, and also physical access. So it's not the coolest bug, but it's still, I thought it was really neat because of the attack vector. So essentially, we broadcast an, N, or an SSID, and it's pretty obvious where this is going. Um, and we just say, we have a new line, a bunch of spaces, encryption, and then some, uh, well, escapes, rather, and then NC star. Uh, NC is netcad, if you're not familiar with it. It allows you to do network traffic. It's great. Um, so yeah, uh, essentially what happens is that when the, due to how the circle is, what you would do when you configure it is you would connect to a hotspot that it broadcast, and then you would say, oh, hey, Circle, can you list all the SSIDs for me so I can see where my network is so I can configure it? And it'll, you know, it'll, it'll just scan out. It'll list and parse all the SSIDs out there for access points. And it would say, all right, you know, these are your, your access points. Which one do you want me to connect to? And then, hey, can you give me a password too? Um, I mean, that, that's sort of standard behavior. There's a couple ways that I've seen IoT devices do this, but the um, broadcasting and AP and doing this is probably the most common. Um, I've seen Bluetooth and not Zigbee for this particular portion, though. But anyways, so the, what the circle did, it would use uh, IW config, I believe, or IW info, to get this output right here where it starts at cell 12 and then address. And then using that SSID that we broadcast, um, we could actually throw a new line in there. We terminate the SSID with a quote, and then we, we set encryption equal to our command injection. Um, Eventually, this is going to get run with shell because they're great and every IoT device creator likes to use system like a million times. 
So essentially, a script is going to get run with the string that we pass in, OK? Um, I mean, that, I guess that's OK. Um, but the cool thing, I feel like, for this particular uh, bug is that for some reason, BusyBox it has a weird version of Netcat. And the only reason, so I, I guess backing up, we, in, an SSID can be 32 bytes. A lot of the bytes that we needed in order to actually get to this point had to be used for, you know, a new line or spaces and, or encryption and so forth. So we ended up only having like six bytes of a command injection, which is why I love this bug. It is Claudio, um, my bestie, he was like, hey Lilith, how, how can we get command injection with six bytes? Or how can we get a reverse shell with six bytes? And I'm like, dude, I don't know, you got this. So what he ended up coming up with was NC star. So with BusyBox Netcat, for some reason, if it can't resolve, maybe it does like an A to I or something. If it can't resolve um, a name, or sorry, for the second parameter, it goes IP and then port, right? So it would do a lookup of the first word, essentially, and due to the folder that the service was running in that we were command injecting into, there's only two files. One was named, I think, run, and the other was named like supervise or something. And it would try to do a DNS lookup of run, and then if we have network access, we can obviously spoof this to ourselves. And send, for some reason, and this is the dumbest thing ever, I think, BusyBox will actually just say, oh, I don't, that's a word you have in the second parameter. Let me just try to connect to port zero instead. So it doesn't fail like NCAT or a uh, regular NetCat. It just tries to resolve port zero, mysterious TCP zero. So if we end up changing our IP tables so we can actually redirect and listen on port zero, we can end up receiving the NC star connection and then just piping a command back to it to get executed. Because if you remember back, we actually had an, um, back ticks around the NC star, which gets executed with whatever we threw in it. So I thought that was just black magic, essentially, and that, I, I don't know, I was really impressed with that. <laughs> it did, we got really lucky with that bug. Um, but yeah, um, which one are we on now? Oh, so this is the last one, I think, yeah. So we actually had one more, and like this one was only a denial of service, but the, um, the scope of this was really funny, because this was one of the sort of those bugs that was like, free the children, you know, let's stop this, this <laughs> infiltration of Disney on our network and just stop the device. So what the device does, like I said before, it parses all the access points and lists them out for the user. Um, and as, as shown before, that's the format through which it does it. Uh, and then it takes the, uh, the signal for that and it actually lists them in strongest to least strongest, and this is how it does it. it uses a big said state, or sorry, a big aux statement and then parses it out, okay? Not, nothing too great here, but if we manage to throw an SSID, again, spoofed with host APD, um, we can actually inject another string into their, sed, or into their awk command, which is great. So we end up with a 16-byte command injection on the best char variable, which is the, the return value of that huge awk statement. Cool. So now that we're here, um, that the, the return value, that best channel variable, gets pe also piped to a said statement. And using some, like I said, Claudio once again with like said black magic, I've, I didn't even know said could do this, but he ends up defining with a limited set of char characters, because once again, we only had like an eight byte payload, um, or, or like a 10 byte payload. We define a label called x slash g, and then we just keep jumping to it, okay? I, I mean, once that happens, infinite loop, right? So, the, once again, I said it was the dial of service, and that might not be that impressive in itself. The cool thing about this one is we seriously just need to broadcast an SSID, and suddenly the device cannot boot. So, I, I thought that was pretty cool. We could just drive, you know, if we know somebody who has one or we want to be a good, like, uncle or aunt, you know, we just <laughs> broadcast this SSID. Um, but yeah, anyways, so I, I like this bug. Um, and finally, uh, this was my favorite bug. Um, I worked on this one a lot. Uh, it's mainly my favorite because of the scope and implications through which it, um, uh, the, basically the implications of the bug. So, and I apologize in advance, you can see the exact moment that I stopped caring about the quality of my slides. So, <laughs> I sort of got a lazy, I just wanted to be a little cheesy because you know, Disney and everything, but. I, like old school PowerPoints have a place in my heart, so. Um, but yeah, um, let me just pour myself some water right quick. Whoop. All right.
Did you like that sound effect? <sighs> okay, so, huh, yeah, like I was saying, um, and when mom and dad are at work or, you know, at somewhere, at, I don't know, wherever mom and dads do, um, they need to be able to make sure their kids aren't up to nefarious purposes on the internet while they're not at home, right? So this device actually has remote capability. It's just like being able to look at your refrigerator's temperature from home. Basically, every IoT device has it. You open an app, and you get to your, your home device. For some reason, you need this. <sighs> Anyways, so yeah, um, once again, remote.meetcircle.co is where your, your phone, your Android device, ended up querying to. And then that, that cloud, aptly pictured, that's an accurate representation, um, would pipe down to your Disney circle. I mean, how do, there's a few questions that obviously arise from this, like how do we deal with the NAT, how do we, get, how do we deal with the implicit home router firewalls, um, how do we know which circle we're actually authenticating to, and how does it know like uh, uh, which circle to go to? Um, but yeah, and what's the authentication? Um, but yeah, first things first, let's, let's talk about how we can actually talk to the circle from remote. There's a beacon. Uh, like, I, I love the theme, of, it's, uh, the theme of the circle because it actually uses a lot of attacker techniques in order to facilitate monitoring your kids. Um, art poisoning, beaconing out, and um, it, it'll actually continuously ping out to remote.meet circle. And it'll, it'll get a Pong back. And then if the remote circle ever feels the need con to connect to you, it'll send a con connect message down that UDP pipe, quote unquote. Um, and that, since the UDP traffic's always flowing, uh, obviously that your, your home router is gonna allow UDP traffic on that port to continuously flow through. So they just send a connect message and then, uh, oh, and that, that's what the UDP traffic looks like, by the by. Um, and it, it's nothing fancy, it just says ping to, and then it gives the MAC address and some random metadata, and then you get a Pong back. Nothing special. Um, but yeah, once it receives the UDP connect command from the, the server, from the cloud, it initiates an SSL connection. Um, and this was one of the SSL connections we were actually able to man in the middle um, using the SSL certificate bug. Um, but yeah, so this is, this. Oh, stop hitting stuff, where am I? Back, yeah, okay. So yeah, this is what the actual SSL traffic looked like. Um, if you'll notice, I had to remove some stuff. I had to redact some stuff. Actually, no, at the bottom, uh, if you look down there, you can see what looks like a MAC address and at the bottom like a date. That's like the authentication token for admin access. So immediately when your circle connects to the cloud, it just sends all your admin creds up to the server, which is great. Um, and it, also, if you'll notice, there's a, there's a few bytes before the actual readable data happens. And well, what, I, what I ended up reversing out of their, uh, their R client, this is where this was happening, it was an R client binary. They had a backdoor protocol, essentially, where like, based off what comes after the Z, they could actually reboot your device, they could SSH into your device, there is an authorized key already located on it, um, what else could they do? They could do a bunch of, I think they could reset your password or change their password. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, Cool, cool stuff they could do with this. Um, anyways, so yeah, so that's question number one. How do they actually talk to the thing? UDP to reverse SSL. And we can actually answer the next two questions at the same time. So, huh, an, upon initial configuration, your phone, in order to talk to the remote server, I mean, you've gotta have some sort of authentication, right? I mean, that just makes sense. You don't want some rando stranger, you know, connecting to your kid's circle and seeing what they're all doing and so forth. Um, but yeah, it generated a PKS12 blob that was base64 encoded, and it just stored it on your phone in an SQL3, or SQLite3 database on your phone slash data partition. So yeah, so your phone talks to the circle, it gets the stuff. And the certificate um, allowed, it, this is essentially the certificate that was on your phone. and. Uh, it, I, I, I had to figure out how I was actually generating it. And it would query a remote server to get this certificate. And in order to, the, the VPN.meet circle, it would actually ask the server, hey, give me a cert, and it got a cert from the server. And the funny thing was, if you look at the, the highlighted portion, um, that's actually more authentication data. Um, so like your, well, granted, using another bug, we could actually uh, take that information and get a remote shell or another reverse shell from, your, from the circle. But anyways, 
um, so keep, keeping on going, in order to generate the certificate, it took four parameters. Um, there's only two that were linked together, the go token at the top and the uh, circle ID, I believe. And I couldn't actually figure out how they were correlating these. There was actually like a hashing mechanism. They're generating a UUID from the circle ID. Um, but everything else you could actually just put in whenever you want and they'd give you a free cert that was signed by the meet circle people. So I, I might have generated a few star certs just for shits and giggles. Um, but yeah, so that, that is the exact code for how it was generated. And you can get basically, as long as you have a valid circle or a MAC address and key, you could just generate whatever cert you wanted, which was sweet. So I'm like, okay, well, um, oh yeah, I guess I just talked about that. Um, so yeah, I mean, that makes sense. We've got a certificate. We can use it for authentication. One might say that it would be a fair assumption to say, oh yeah, the device is just using that, that certificate. It's got your information in it, so naturally the server's gonna parse it and be like, oh, I need to send them to this circle right here. I mean, that, that is a logical assumption to make, right? I gave him too much credit. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, there goes my plan for like bricking or rooting, because we had, you know, remote roots, we had remote bricks, and I'm like, man, you know, it'd be sweet if we could root or brick any circle in the world, regardless. Like, I'm like, this is why I wanted the bug, is because of the implications thereof. Like, we don't even need to be able to, like, directly talk to your circle. Uh, we can just talk to it. And thankfully, my assumptions were wrong about their authentication model. So what they actually used to decide which circle to talk to, which, which circle your phone would talk to, was the string in the query itself. <laughs> so yeah, uh, first part, that's easily generatable. I mean, granted, that is the authentication token, the highlighted part up there. It's generated on the circle, and you know, I, I, we, we tried brute forcing or figuring out how it was generated. You're not gonna brute force that. Um, the, the middle portion's the hard part. Uh, the first portion is actually the MAC address. The last portion the, is the date it was generated, but the middle portion is a pain. So we weren't actually able to get that. I mean, and once again, my dreams were dashed because I'm like, oh, remote bricks, come on. Um, but yeah, so it was, it was impossible to actually do that, which made me really sad. I, I had to take a day off or something. So. <laughs> the cool thing was they didn't actually use the entire string for that. They only used the MAC address. <laughs> so yeah, um, who knows stuff about MAC addresses? How many bytes of a MAC address are you know unique per the device typically? And, and, and I guess what I mean is the, the I mean you might not be able to brute force that. Like how many bytes is that? Twelve bytes I think typically, right? But only six bytes of a MAC address are device specific. The rest of them are vendor. And the first six, or the first six byte, or sorry, yeah, six bytes of that are gonna be all for circle. That's what they've been assigned. That's what they're always gonna use. So we can easily brute force, um, come on, do the stuff. Yeah, we can easily brute force and talk to any circle in the world. So that was, that was kind of why I wanted to do this talk is, I feel like the dangers of IoT devices, when we can do stuff like that, you have to be a little concerned because um, while we are only talking to some like, I don't know, I wouldn't call it a toy, but like there's valuable information on this thing. You don't want an attacker to have a foothold onto your network just because ironically, you decided to try and protect your, protect your kids from the internets and hackers, like you did the complete opposite. So having all these refrigerators and microwaves that are smart might not be so smart, guys. But um, keeping it real. <laughs> and yeah, one one last thing, um, as part of the talk, there was actually an API command that you could send an SMS to the admin of the owner. So Claudio, Claudio is not happy about that. <laughs> I was just spamming it. Probably sent him like a thousand SMSs. It was great. But yeah, so. Um, I think I've, I think I've got a good amount of time still. Um, I've got a demo for you all. Um, I, I hope it goes well. I did not appease the demo gods and I didn't actually record this. So we're just gonna do it live because yeah, why not? So we'll see how this goes. So if you'll give me one second, we shall do the demo. Oh, can I talk into this one? Sweet. Whew. We're getting there guys. So, originally, 
That's the sun. Yeah, the sun. Cool. So originally, I was going to opt for one of the wireless SSID bugs for a demo, but then I realized like I didn't want to have to bring my Raspberry Pi in a like a goddamn Faraday cage so that y'all wouldn't interfere with this. So. <laughs> so I decided to opt for the safer method. Um, this was actually the first exploit that we used to gain access to the thing. Um, it's my, my, little, my little child. I love it. Um, it's, uh, it's named letitgo.py, so <laughs> get a little, a little kick out of that. All right, so the first thing's first. Um, um, the, the first requirement of this network access, we're going to be doing DNS spoofing and uh, DHCP. We have control of the network, essentially. We have a foothold in the network. We can't do this wirelessly, or, you know, anyways. So the traffic that you see is over this Ethernet cord. Interestingly, oh, oh, sorry, guys. I apologize. Thank you for pointing that out. Bam. Cool. All right, so this is this is the thing that I wanted to show you. All right, so um, to the left we have DNS traffic flowing from the circle to our to my my laptop. Um, we're going to be spoofing, redirecting some traffic from there to me, and I'm going to have a server that's going to get me access. I actually uh, I actually locked myself out of the device on purpose because I, I, I don't know I just thought it'd be more fun. Um, so if we do the IP of the device right now, as shown by the DNS traffic, is 192.168.0.37. So I've got an SSH key um, called Disney IRSA. So SSH, nope, that's not it. SSH. Dot o dot, uh, what was it? 37 hyphen I, I or Disney IDRSA. So this is going to fail, obviously, because I actually fa factor reset it because I wanted to. I don't know, it'd be cool. So since there's a password, obviously, uh, the, the, the key did not work. So what we're going to do is I'm going to do python let it go dot py. We've got that running. All right, I'm going to, just to make it go faster, because I don't actually have to do this, but it just makes it go faster. I'm going to unplug it. I'm going to replug it. And now we wait. Um, so. It's got a bunch of cron jobs, tiny cron jobs that'll do like our updates and so forth. And the funny thing was is that they don't really know, realize that they should probably do their updates over <laughs> HTTPS instead of HTTP. <laughs> I mean, come on, guys, this is like basic shit. <laughs> so yeah, even though, <laughs> yeah, that was. I mean, it was an easy exploit, but reliable. I liked it. So we've done the stuff. So hopefully now I can SHN. So demo gods. Yeah, easy peasy. <laughs> Boop. We got root because naturally everything runs as root. I mean, come on. <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. So yeah, I, I think that's that was the demo. I mean, simple, easy. Um, going back to my stuff, my slides. There's not much slides left. How do we start from here, yo? Uh, whatever. I'll just I'll just do this. It's too late. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, um, yeah, that was that was essentially. Um, I still got a bunch of time, so we can do a Q and A, I guess. Then, so I guess I went a little fast. I apologize. Yeah, what's up? Ah, how is this disclosed? The classic question. So, um, typically, we do responsible disclosure as is Talos, like as Talos as a business unit. That is, that is what we do. Um, we notify the vendor. I believe we give them a 90-day deadline before we zero-day them, and it typically goes well. I think we get a lot of positive feedback from that. I mean, it's enough time, I would think, for the vendors to fix it. With regards to the My Circle, that's the company name, but I always call them Meet Circle, regardless. Um, with regards to the response, they were actually really, really, really quick to respond, which surprised me. Um, and they, they got their stuff fixed relatively quick. Um, they were super positive about it. Um, I believe there was some initial pushback from the higher management. Um, but once they talked to the engineers, I think everyone was really on board. So it was actually pretty cool working with these um, people on, their, on the bug fixes. I mean, that was pr pretty much the, the most pleasant experience I've ever had with somebody doing a bug fix. So questions? Anyone? Come on, guys. I, I feel lonely up here. 
Oh, what's up? Um, hi, what's up? What version of Linux on the on the box itself? Okay, yeah, one sec. Um, I think it was WRT or OpenWRT, if I recall correctly. Um, one second, I will go back to my root prompt. Yeah, um, putting this down. All right, yeah, cool. So, um, yeah, it was OpenWRT Barrier Breaker. I believe that's an old version, too. So, um, so sorry? Yeah, okay, yeah. L like I was saying before, like, firmware updates are definitely an issue. So, um, this device is no exception. Uh, all right, cool. Oh, yeah, I feel special. What's up? Um, yeah, actually, uh, so, uh, <laughs> um, so I believe on the first set, um, the first fix, everything but one bug was fixed, like a, a kind of minor bug, so, um, they, they did push updates both to the phone and to the devices themselves, so, um, as I was saying before, how your device, um, updates over HTTP, <laughs> it would reach out to the download.meetcircle.co domain, excuse me, and grab, grab the updated firmware as this, uh, the trend is changing, I suppose, like, in a lot of older embedded devices, there's strictly no, no reasonable, feasible way to update the firmware, because, I mean, the device doesn't have any communication methods at all, so, um, the tr like I said, the uh, firmware updates are an issue, and, um, but this one was able to push an update relatively quick. I think it was in like a month that everything was golden. So, like I said, I I, I want to give props to the my circle people because they really did a good job with this. So, I mean, I might not agree with the product philosophically, but the the people seem cool. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right, I saw a question in the back. Oh, two questions. Oh, so many questions. Uh, yes, sir, you. Oh yeah, no, I actually didn't cover that. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, I need to I need to walk around. Okay, so um, the process essentially was we managed to find a site um, that had had some previous research. Thankfully, um, so they had managed to get um, like they had a version of the firmware, and that was the current version of the firmware. So we we had some. Inf it wasn't the entire firmware, but we had some scripts. So. Once we had the scripts, um, I was able to develop that exploit that we had up there um, and gain our initial foothold. And then once we had the foothold into the device, that's when shit started to, you know, shake loose. Like, we just examined every single binary, um, and we would either fuzz it, um, we've got, a, you know, a couple of cool fuzzers, um, or just do, you know, throw the thing in Ida Pro and see, see what we can find, to see actually how it worked. Because um, I, I feel like the, when you're working on an IoT device, it's just like working on any other embedded device. Instead of there being, an, you're not working on one binary with a bunch of components and functions and so forth. Um, you're working, I, I like to think of the IoT device as like just a bunch, like one binary, but each script or each mini small binary is a, like a, you know, a piece of it. So uh, we would essentially just break it down. Hey, let me throw this, you know, the APID or the R client. I wonder how it's doing remote communication. If you break down the architecture and find, think, okay, well, how could they possibly be SSHing into this box? Then you're like, okay, well, this bar, you know, this, the R client's got, or, you know, a backdoor protocol that allows them to pipe SSH to their SSH server locally and so forth. So, um, I'm not sure if that answered your question. I think I went on a little tangent there. Um, but we essentially just looked at each binary and we would, you know, grep on scripts and so forth. I mean, there was a lot of, uh, some of the bugs were found through fuzzing, some of them were found through manual analysis, some of them were just found through source code review, so. Is, oh, cool. Oh, 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 wait, that, why are you, why, can you raise this? Oh, hi, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like, who was looking up what domain name, the date the domain name was looked up, it stores phone numbers, email addresses, um, of least the administrator, I don't think they need to be real, but, um, yeah, there's a lot of personal identifiable information on there, and I mean, the fact that it ARPs, if you, if you can manage to get on it, the fact that it ARPs spoofs your entire network, 
means all traffic's going through it. So <laughs> that, I mean, that's pretty critical. Um, yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No, that was. Oh yeah. So the funny thing was is that that back door initially I'm like WTF mate, you know? Uh, why is there an authorized key on this thing? And initially I was thinking, or you know, we were thinking like. Who can, you can't SSH into this thing. Like, why is this here? It didn't make sense. But after we did some more investigation and, you know, I, I managed to figure out how it was doing communication OTA through the cloud, um, then we found that. And I'm like, oh God, that's, that's wrong, you know? And it's funny because around that same time, they actually added a feature inside of the app itself where you press a button for debugging and it would say, hey, I want to enable remote support. And at that point, the SSH server would come up. And it wouldn't be up until that point. But the funny thing was, is that anyone with an administrator token could send the API request to enable the SSH. And as, as I think I mentioned before, like when you make, when the circle makes its initial connection, it sends that authentication token to the remote server. So like there was essentially no change from having that port open and nothing to once they made that change. Cause you know, it's in the user's control, quote unquote, but like anyone could have enabled it again. But Thankfully, um, one of the fixes they did have, and like I said, they like the the authorized key. I believe is still there. Um, I, I haven't checked the latest updates, um, but what they had done to fix it is that um, for certain uh, API requests through that reverse protocol, I suppose, um, certain API calls were not allowed. One of those was the enable debug API. So they did end up fixing it. So questions, or am I free? Oh, stop. I'm supposed to stop. All right. Well, thank you, people. Um, I hope you have a great time and the hangovers get better. So, cheers.